If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires upfield into the end zone. It is caught. Jelani Woods. Touchdown. He's going to fire upfield. It's broken up. Tip and intercepted by the Colts. This is the official Colts podcast, giving you an updated look at what's new with the horseshoes. Colts have it. Interception. Two seconds left. And the Colts are going to win. In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. What's up, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the official Colts podcast presented by Win Las Vegas. I'm JJ Stankovitz in for Jeffrey Gorman in the hot seat this week <laughs> with Lara Overton. Got a lot to get to on this show. If you're watching us on YouTube, thanks for watching. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any of those services, thank you for spending your Boxing Day with us. Oh, if you that's so celebrate. Right. There you go. I still actually never figured out what Boxing Day is. I just I know they celebrate in England. Oh, is it England? That's what it could be. Like, it's a lot, it's yeah, Eng- they, yeah, England. Watch a lot of kid, soccer. Oh, okay. Yeah. It seems like you'd watch boxing. Yeah, I mean, you, theoretically. Yeah. Christmas Day was great, by the way, watching all that football. Oh, Three games. Exactly. Oh, I know. Uh, poor NBA. Just poor, so sorry to the NBA. I know. For but the, the NFL sorry, taking no, it over. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> great day of football watching. They get it every. The NBA gets it every year, though. The NFL only does right. when it falls on particular days. Like it's not going to happen when Christmas is on a Tuesday, right? Yeah. Theoretically, well, yeah, I guess nothing. <laughs> is, yeah, theoretically, nothing right. is out of the realm of possibility. We got a lot to get to on the show before we get out of here. Um, Lair, the Colts lose twenty nine to ten to the Atlanta Falcons on Christmas Eve. Kind of didn't have a total chance to digest it because you get home, it's Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. go. You know, do Christmas. I know you were traveling to be yeah. with family. I was kind of all over with family. What just sort of, when you kind of think about, okay, like the, not a, a whole lot, if anything, went right in this game. Where the it just opening kinda, drive. Right. The opening drive went great. And then after that, not mm-hmm. much. Just kind of, wh- why, why, why is this Colts team so up and down? I think that was kind of the big question I had coming in t- into today is over the last four games, you got. Uh, you know, the big win over the Titans, lost to the Bengals. Big win over the Steelers, lost to the Falcons. Kind of just this this roller coaster right now in December. Any one reason or particular thing that comes to mind when you think about why this team's kind of up and down? I talked to Zaire Franklin in the locker room immediately after, and he's just all of these guys, total pros. In particular, Zaire is like a go-to guy where you know, like win, loss, highs, lows. Like you can, he's always just going to give you great perspective and insight, and he told us after the game that, you know, Gardner had addressed, we can't take these opportunities for granted. Like being in this position with December football, this is something that you can't just be used to or think that this is just something that is, is you're accustomed to. And then listening to some of Gardner post game as well, he said, I don't know if we approached this game with the right urgency. Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting from Gardner because he knows what teams can do that are in a playoff push. He knows how teams have to conduct themselves when they are in a position of making a run to the postseason. And I liked that he just called it out. And I agree. It seems like that the Colts have had trouble almost getting back to the middle. They've really ridden the highs and the lows and like responded really well from losses. When you look at how you rebounded from Cincinnati and came out against Pittsburgh, but they've almost had trouble kind of hitting the reset button going from one to the next and just getting like back to level in between that period. And kind of you ramped up to the Steelers with such great focus and I, you know, and then you, I, I, think that over the course of the week you were getting Jonathan back that was really encouraging you were really encouraging with you were really encouraged with getting Michael Pittman back um you know he was limited full cleared concussion protocol but then out for the game so I think that was a huge curveball into the game plan mm-hmm. going in against this really stout Falcons defense I mean they're top 10 in a number of defensive right. categories I think that was something that was really difficult for this team to overcome you could do it for you know three quarters against Pittsburgh um, but I think doing so four quarters and having a game plan that was clearly tailored to Pittman and some explosive plays yeah. in the passing game that I do believe was a factor in not allowing you to open up maybe the playbook and take as many deep shots as you potentially would have liked to something Gardner Minshew mentioned after the game too is you know, just because they the Falcons came out, they lost to the Panthers the week prior. Mm-hmm. You know, one day after the Colts beat the Steelers, and that that just sort of 
you know, he said you can't take this for granted. You can't take it for granted that you're even in this playoff run because teams, you know, guys might think this happens every year or this happens, you know, once every couple, you know, two years or whatever. Right. And he's like, that's not, that's not the case. You, you never know when the next one of these opportunities is going to come by. And I think this goes to a young team kind of learning how to win in December. I mean, remember that stat before the season that the Colts had like the third youngest roster right. in the NFL? And I think there are a lot of players who are learning right now. Maybe guy, even guys who are on this team in 2021 as rookies, but you know your head's kind of swimming as a rookie. Um, or even if they were young in 2020 when the Colts last made the playoffs, just, hey, this is what it's going to take to to go down the stretch and make the playoffs. And it is very much... You have to stay, you have to, like you mentioned, Larry, I think you got to stay in that middle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear guys say that cliche, never too high, never too low. That's something the Colts really do need to kind of hit on over these final two games. Well, another factor, I think, too, is that you almost have to take ownership of, we didn't fight this hard to rally back from the losing streak that we were on and all the adversity that we've overcome to just not get in. You know, like, I think that you also have to look at, we haven't fought this hard to only get here. Like, it's this is not going to be, you know, any sort of a moral victory to be like, oh, well, you know, we lost AR and we didn't have JT for X number of games and, you know, we didn't have Grover for six games and this, 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 and this. Uh, and oh well you know we exceeded expectations like you can't be complacent with that right. and that's where I think that this team has to embrace all that they've fought through to get to this point and then use that as motivation through these final two I guess if there's any silver lining to it is at least that was an AFC or an, an NFC opponent that statistically yeah. the playoff implications of the remaining four games of the season were the least when it came to the Falcons game versus Steelers, Raiders, and Texans. Right. And now, my God, those Raiders and Texans games are massive. Yeah. But you got them at home. The, I mean, that we mentioned that, I think, a couple weeks ago in this podcast, that, okay, if the Colts are going to go 10-7, yeah. and seven, the game you need to lose is the Falcons. Like, if you're going to lose a game, it's to the Falcons mm -hmm. because it doesn't impact your standing with your AFC record, which currently the Colts are 6-4 and four in the AFC which would mean that in the event of a three-way tie or a four-way tie or whatever it might be mm. for a final wild card spot, the Colts would have the advantage based on NFL tiebreakers. Yeah, it's so frustrating because you look and there were... Could be you leading know, the division you today. You could be leading the division. <laughs> and now, you know, Las Vegas is coming and riding really high after mm -hmm. beating the Chiefs, preventing the Chiefs from winning another division title. Yep. So they're looking to play spoiler. They're rallying behind an interim head coach who they love. Like, they have a great defense. Mm -hmm. They've just kind of found guys to get jobs done when, you know, backup running backs, backup quarterbacks across the board. They're a team that kind of makes the most of who they have each yeah. and every Sunday. Yeah, Antonio Pierce is doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job there. Um, this is th this is kind of crunch time now, and there's no room for error. Right? The, no, you can't. Like there are backdoor ways the Colts could make the playoffs at nine and eight, but they, that's not. You don't want to back into the playoffs at nine and eight. You want to win out. Yeah, you're like slinking in. You're like crawling right. into the playoffs. Exactly. Like, yeah. You don't want to do that. You want to win out. The Colts do not control their own destiny if they win out, though. That is the important thing to note here. If the Colts win out, they're probably in the playoffs. But if they win out, the Jaguars win the division. And the Colts and Bengals are the only two teams with ten and seven records. Then the Bengals make the playoffs over the Colts. Assume this is again because assuming the head -to -head. right because I had it. This is assuming Buffalo and Cleveland both win more than ten games and make the playoffs. There's a lot that can still happen. Don't you kind of feel like if this were like the college football playoff system, like Buffalo would be voted in? You know what I mean? Oh, uh, like, Buffalo! Buffalo like, would be like, yeah. <laughs> no, like there wouldn't be a representative from the <laughs> AFC South. Or probably yep. the AFC West. Right. It would just, well, I mean, maybe Kansas City. Yeah, it would be, the Bills just would be like the two speaking, seed. Politically speaking, they're yeah. going to find a way to get Buffalo The Bills would be in. the two seed, yeah. And then we can, you know, maybe have, uh, uh, you know, the governor of our great state uh, send a, you know, strongly worded message to whatever. A tersely worded email. Whatever that was that happened yeah. with Florida State. Um, but the, the point being, you don't want to go into week 18 needing help, right? Yeah. But the Colts do need a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. So big game this weekend is the Chiefs and Bengals for me, where if the Bengals lose that game, you're, you're good. You're set. Week 18 is then a win and in. This is, again, assuming the Colts win in week 17. If the Bengals win that game, 
and the Jaguars beat the Panthers. And the bill, I mean, th- this is so convoluted. It's all on Colts.com if you don't want to listen to me like talk through it, like the, you know, galaxy braining it. Um, <laughs> Pepe Sylvia. Right. Yeah. I got boxes full of Pepe. Uh, I got boxes full of playoff scenarios, is what it feels like. The, it, it, the Bills, if the Bills, Jaguars, and Bengals all win this weekend, mm-hmm. then the Colts, even if they beat the Raiders, will need help next, next weekend. But if one of those teams loses, then the Colts are in a win and in. So that's what we're looking at right here. It is, it's, this is, this is a really interesting and fun time. Um, the thing I wanted to go back to just when we think about the, like the things the Colts need to lean on now in these final two games, we're, we're not thinking about what Buffalo's doing or what Jacksonville's doing. Like internally, what does this team need to do over the final two games to make sure they can come out with a 10 and seven record with the best shot of making the playoffs. To me, the two two things really stand out. You got to get after the quarterback. Yes. The Colts are seven and zero when having four or more sacks in a game this year, and they are one and six without those and when they go under four. Anticlimactic was it this past week? They break the record, but it was delayed because you had to wait for it to come up on the stats to figure out if it was going to be scored as a sack for Quiddy Pay. So it was just kind of funny. I was like, oh, okay. Like you felt like, oh man, they're going to break the record. There's going to be this like explosive moment, right? And then it was like, he gets to Taylor Heineke and then it's like, wait, everyone's like waiting. And it was just like on. It was a zero yard sack. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of a a weird way in how it unfolds. It's kind of indicative of the day as a whole. Yeah. Really. But now they do own the franchise record for the Indianapolis era for most sacks in a single season. 47. still... Two games to go. So the so the, when I was looking at the sack numbers, this defense to me there's and, and fourteen different guys. I was yeah, just asking JJ guys, about yeah. this. That to me is I think what's crazy because you think about like you know obviously the the Mathis Freeney era Colts you had these power rushers, these great guys on the edges. You didn't have necessarily the depth that this Colts defense. The does. Colts are only one. They're they're one of two teams in the NFL right now to have three players with eight or more sacks. It's them and the Dolphins. So there, that also speaks to the depth. The Quiddy Pay's got eight, Dio's got eight and a half, and uh, Samson is nine and a half, I believe, or maybe Quiddy is eight and a half. I don't remember exactly what it is, but um, to me, it's it, it. Can this defensive line get after the quarterback? Yeah. Because that stat I just mentioned, where if you get four sacks in a game, you have seven wins. That is all, but one of your wins this season has come when you've got four sacks in a game. The problem is teams have figured out how to use their running backs to diminish the Colts' ability to get after the quarterback. Mm -hmm. The Bengals did a really good job of this with their screen game. The Falcons did a really good job of it by getting B. John Robinson in Mm -hmm. space. That's something that I I asked Gus Bradley about that on Tuesday, of like, hey, like, what's kind of the common thread to getting these sacks or not getting them? And he mentioned it's the running backs and how they're being used, but it's not necessarily just hand the ball off to the running back. It's using them in different creative ways to slow down the pass rush. Mm -hmm. So it's going to start with, can you stop those ways? I mean, the big challenge for the Colts going into week 15 was, can you stop the screen game Mm -hmm. after they got gashed bad? The Colts stopped the screen game against the the Steelers. Now it's going to be, can you make tackles in space? Can you make sure that if you get a running back, and, and Josh Jacobs and Zamir White are not like guys you necessarily think of like, being explosive in space. Josh yeah. Jacobs is kind of your kind of more, straight. More of a north-south guy. Right, yeah. more of a north-south guy. But you're going to have to stop the run to get after the passer. And the Colts are going to have to do that this weekend. And then with the Texans coming in town to get them into, you know, getting third and longs where you can really get aggressive as a pass rush. And the Colts weren't really able to do that against the Bengals and then the Falcons. And we saw the results of both of those games. And – you felt like, too, the way that they were able to grind you down a little bit in the run game Atlanta was, and as much as you were feeding JT, you didn't have, with you know, without having Zach Moss this week, you weren't able to have that kind of compliment where Zach mm-hmm. is the guy who is able to kind of punish defensive fronts and wear guys down, grind guys down with the way he runs and, you know, carries, drags bodies with him, breaks tackles. You didn't really have that element in compliment to Jonathan. So hopefully Zach's able to make that progress because he is so valuable to you um, as an offense, especially when, you know, you did lack some of the explosiveness in the passing game. That'll be huge this week. I think for me, the biggest thing, it's 
and this is something we hear coaches say all the time, in particular Coach Steichen, winning the turnover battle. Like, you just cannot be so careless with the football as we saw this team, and kind of uncharacteristically so. You know, it was a team that had been really good for, you know, such – significant stretches of the season and then you have a game like that where they force you into some serious miscues and in particular some timely miscues as well well and, and Atlanta you know the the Colts didn't get a turnover uh for the first time in 19 games against the Falcons but they had opportunities you, oh my gosh Zaire Franklin had to have been kicking himself yeah. so much because there was one that was almost in end of the right end of the him. first half uh Zaire jumps the route Ball hits him in the hands. Uh, Gus, absolutely beautiful read. Yeah, oh, perfect. Great I instinct. mean, nailed it. And Gus Bradley said, Zaire, if you pick that off, he might score on that play. That might be a defensive touchdown. All of a sudden, you flip the entire momentum of the game. Then coming out of halftime, Taylor Heineke drops the snap right out of halftime. Yeah. The Colts are not able to fall on it. Falcons get the ball back. They go down, and they score. Mm-hmm. Just moments like that where this, t- this team has been really good at taking advantage of those takeaway opportunities – didn't against the Falcons that allowed Atlanta to keep their momentum. But another thing that I, I was just kind of thinking about with the kind of the up and down sort of variance we've seen with this team is the defense really is relying on sacks and turnovers mm-hmm. to generate a lot of success. Mm-hmm. And those are not necessarily things that you can count on game to game. Yeah. You can have games where you get six sacks and three takeaways and you're going to win by 30. But then you're going to get games where the team has a plan to make sure we're not going to turn the ball over and we're going to have a good protection mm-hmm. plan. It's difficult to replicate those performances week it is. in and week out. Right. Yeah. And that is where I think you're seeing some of the defensive variants of the up and down. Mm-hmm. And on offense, I think some of it is it is in the run game, where you look at some of these games where the Colts have, have put up some good points. You think about Tampa. You think about Pittsburgh, where the run games got going. Mm-hmm. Um that's got to be more consistent over these final two games against Vegas and Houston. The Colts have won games where they haven't ran the ball well. I think they averaged under three yards a carry against the Titans in week 13. But you can't really count on that. That's, yeah. not, that's not a recipe for consistent success. Right, right. And, you know, you've also, in, in that game as well, you really had a healthy mix of getting Alec Pierce involved early. Right. You had Michael Pittman obviously making the clutch, clutch grabs he did. You also got really creative within the offense. You know, you saw those plays that went to Kylan Granson um, in the Titans game as well. And you did not have that luxury this week against Atlanta to – be as creative and, you know, right. integrate some of those type of trick plays as we've seen them do in the past. But, you know, I did like a lot of, you know, Will Mallory in there was getting involved. Mm-hmm. There was a ton to Kylan Granson. I was really excited for Josh Downs early against Atlanta. I thought that was going to be a game where he could really shine. Unfortunately, they just, you know, the Falcons adapted so well. Um, it will be interesting, though, to see, you know, what that – um, workload is for Josh Downs in these next two games, I think, because he is that interesting weapon that adds a compliment uh, to the offense that, you know, no one else really gives you in that aspect. And then also, you know, in the return game as well. Mm-hmm. This was, you know, first game where he had, well, second game yeah. for him having those return duties. And that was something he told me going into training camp. He, really hadn't returned regularly since high school, did it a little bit in college, but he was such a heavy part of their offense that they didn't have him do a ton of uh, special teams, a ton of returning. So I think that'll be another aspect. Now having Josh in that role for a third week will be you know, interesting to see how he further develops. Yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on Michael Pittman Jr.'s status this week too. Yeah, that, um, was, really inter- that was an interesting one for him. Yeah. Weird, but then develop some symptoms upon arriving in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So out of utmost precaution, make sure to protect Pitt. I mean, it was honestly kind of miraculous that he had even cleared prior to that when you see the magnitude of that hit that he took. He was cleared by an independent neurologist and then developed symptoms again. And, you know, that that does happen. Concussions are one of those things that... You, you sometimes you never know, well, and you have with to factors like travel, you know, and yeah. everything like that that can trigger some of yeah. those. You things. you have to make sure you're following mm-hmm. the protocol and what's best for the player, and you know we'll we'll see if Pittman can progress through the protocol. He's back in the concussion protocol. Um, we'll see if he gets through it this week. If not, the Colts are going to have to have a full plan for not having him out there. Um, you know, and, and Jim Bob Cooter talked a little bit about it on Tuesday that you know you have games where. 
you know, your your top player gets hurt four plays into the game and you got to adapt. Yeah. It's nothing new for coaches to have a week where you're practicing with a player and they're like Pittman and then you lose him early in a game. That's nothing new, but it still is definitely a challenge. I mean, losing a guy who's got, what, 99 catches and mm-hmm. over 1,000 yards mm-hmm. when you're kind of thinking all through the week you're going to have him. Right. That's a big part of your offense that you're you're down all of a sudden. Oh, huge, huge part of the offense. So, yeah, that's one thing. You know, Colts will have a walkthrough on Wednesday, as they typically have had the last few weeks, practice Thursday and Friday to make that plan. And then also, I mean, kind of as we're looking ahead over these final two games of this season, still interesting what could happen with that Texans game. That could end up being either a primetime game, could be a Saturday game, which we're still a few days away from knowing exactly the scheduling on that, right, JJ? We are. Uh, that will come out after the conclusion of Week 17. Um, those games, which I don't know if we're gonna, they're gonna make us wait until the the ball drops on New Year's Eve <laughs> for the Packers and Vikings game to end. But yeah, um, that'll be interesting because the NFL might say if if that game isolated is like a win and in for both teams. That's going to get Saturday, 4.30, 8.15, or Sunday night football. But if that game, if if the winner of that game's playoff positioning is dependent on the Jaguars game, the Bengals game, whatever, the NFL might want those games being played at the same time. So no one has an advantage of knowing exactly. the outcome of right. one of the other games. So so we'll, we'll see about that. Also, some late breaking news here as we are wrapping up recording. Julian Blackman is on injured reserve. He is out for the year. Uh, with the shoulder injury he sustained against the Falcons. Wow. So I guess technically he's not. If the Colts were to make, let's see, I mean, got to miss four games. So if the Colts were to make the AFC championship, he could return. return. That would be the first time he would be eligible to return. So I'll tell you from where I was standing on the sidelines in game because of my position with radio sidelines, You know, I saw Julian make the hit, and it was kind of awkward how he, how he came into it, how he came into the tackle, I should say, and was down on the ground for quite a while. And I mean – Julian Blackman has been an absolute Iron Man because yeah. prior to that injury, I don't think he missed a snap. He'd played like every defensive mm-hmm. snap the entire season. And he was obviously down on the field for a while, a couple of train athletic trainers, medical staff surrounding him. When he finally got up, he was immediately the, he was flexing and contracting his hand, you know, trying to clutch his fist, do all of that. So it almost seemed like that he was trying to get either feeling or movement, you know, into that lower part of his arm. So very interesting right there. So unfortunate for Julian because yeah. prior to, you know, he battled through injuries at the end of college. He had that torn Achilles uh, from two years ago, right? I'm trying yep. to do the math uh, on that. That was the one he had in practice. Yes, two um, years ago. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then last year he was – he was healthy last yeah, it was year. Was healthy last year. Um, and he's had a contract a year. He's had having such. He's year. had such a great year. Such an unfortunate outcome for Julian. You hate that. Also, just one of the greatest dudes. Like yeah. in general, in that locker room. So hate that for him. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nick Cross has had some big shoes to fill at mm-hmm. various points this season. Uh, he has not only been you know a special teams ace, but the times he's come in on defense, he is you know proving to be the guy who the Colts wanted him to be, or being closer to the level of expectation that the Colts saw when he was drafted last year. Yeah, I mean th- this is now a big spot for Nick Cross and and for Rodney Thomas the yep. second as well. Those guys are going to be counted on in the back end, a back end that's already pretty young. Mm-hmm. Now you even get younger with without Julian Black there back there. Um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but you got to be up for the challenge, and this is what late-season football looks like. Every team's dealing with something, and yeah. the Colts have certainly dealt with a lot, and this is just another hey, thing they're going to have to deal with. The Colts will face another backup quarterback this week in Aiden O'Connell. Yep, Purdue's own. Yeah. Um, all right, well, <laughs> here we go. One buckle up. Buckle up. I I mean, this is gonna be a fun next couple of days. Um gonna have plenty of stuff on Colts.com, Colts three sixty. Um, yeah. you know, getting you ready for the Raiders, getting you ready for playoff scenarios. Right. I'm gonna have a viewing guide up because I keep getting all these questions, Lara, of like, well, who should I root for in this game? Who right. should I root for in that game? So I'm just gonna list that all out on Colts.com later this week. What games matter, what results you need. Uh, and then hopefully the Colts can get some good fortune as well as a win Absolutely. on Sunday. That's, you know, all I want for my final, uh, you know, my final ask of 2023, Colts win to close out the year. That'd be great. You know, and look ahead, close out the year, not the season. Yeah. The season continues. Well, we at least have one more game. Let's hope we play a little deeper into January. 
Let's do it. All right. Well, thank you for watching us here on the Official Colts Podcast presented by Win Las Vegas. If you are watching on YouTube, if you're listening, thank you so much for listening to us here. Matt Taylor will be back with Thursday's edition of the Official Colts Podcast. That'll be with Bill Brooks, Casey Vallier, and a player guest previewing Colts and Raiders. So long.